So my name is Stephanie Horowitz. I'm an, an architect and managing director at Zero Energy Design. We're a firm based here in Boston, uh, <clears throat> covering full service uh, architecture as well as mechanical design. And we take a multidisciplinary approach to designing high performance homes and buildings. Um, about 70% of our work is, is full service and I'm going to present one of those projects today. And about 30% is consulting, where we collaborate with other professionals and, and builders. But no matter the client or the process, uh, excuse me, the, the client or the project, our process is really marked by informed decision making. So I, I thought I'd spice things up today and show something that is uh, not market rate um, and, uh, and, and not affordable, but it has a, a little bit of an interesting twist to it. Uh, the, the project that mentioned in the, the program, the um, New England Passive House Retreat, uh, we've got a board up for, for that if you're interested. Um, so the Brookline residence, not too far from here, it's a, it's a single family home that is nearing completion. Um, the contractor, uh, AB Construction, uh, has been working on it with us for, for the past year or so. And uh, we're, we're just starting to kind of wrap up our, our punch list items. The project was unique and just starting with the client and the program. Um, so we had not one couple to design for, but, but two. Um, and what they asked for was, was not a single family home that had an in-law suite, um, but rather a, a single family home that has dual living spaces. Um, the younger couple lives there full time the older couple lives there about half the year, and the younger couple has two kids that are roughly college age that, that stay home seasonally. And so that was, that was sort of the first challenge, was, was to design a home with a, a limited footprint um, that could accommodate this aggressive program. Um, and, and that's something that's, that's really sort of articulated in, in the form of the house. So the older couple in pink, occupies the first level uh, where we have a, a master suite on the, the back of the house, a dedicated office, and a, a kitchen and living space on the front. The older couple has the top, excuse me, the younger couple has the top two floors with their um, master suite on the, the third floor for a little bit of separation, uh, and their living space on, on the second floor. They have a shared entry and they have a, a shared basement space with a walkout condition that, that definitely increases the, the square footage a bit. And a central stairwell that plays a, a number of roles that I'll, I'll sort of come back to. The program was a particular challenge uh, because of the site that we were designing on. We maximized the setbacks. Uh, the house is sort of skewed on the lot um, but, but we're building to the side and rear setbacks. And uh, we're also maximizing the height as well as the allow, allowable floor area. And that was something that came into play when we started to think about wall sections. So uh, to give you an idea of scale, our, our TFA is just shy of 3,000 square feet, which is roughly equal to uh, the gross area on our building permit. Uh, which accounts for the first floor and the second floor measured to the outside of sheathing, so it's not penalizing us for the rigid insulation. Uh, and it also has uh, accounts for the 86 square feet, uh, square foot footprint of our stair uh, in the basement because it's an open stair system. So this is not a passive house, but it could be, and I'll come back to that. It just needs an S. <laughs> <laughs> I admittedly did not spell check before I put this together. <laughs> and spelling is not my strong point. Um, so th this is where we are right now. Um, if, if we had built the house to code uh, relative to where we are now, we've realized about a 71% savings in, in site energy. Uh, there's a small uh, PV array on the roof which uh, is shaded. Uh, for part of the day and part of the year, um, but it was the 
the right thing to do, um, and so the, the owner agreed to incorporate it. If we had gone to Passive House, we would have realized about an extra 10% savings. Um, I think that some of our initial numbers were actually a little bit high and were, were probably a little bit um, uh, better than a 70% savings uh, with the, the final design. So the challenge that we took on for this project was to design a free <coughs> house. And it wasn't something that was driven uh, by, by the owners, it was a purely kind of internal discussion of, you know, can we do this? Um, we've, we've done foam in the past, we've, we've used XPS, and we don't do that anymore. We've learned our lesson, um, but this was a really nice opportunity to, um, to try something different. Uh, so kind of a quick snapshot of the, the specs that, that were used. Uh, we had a little bit of a problem procuring the mineral, mineral wool for the roof system, and uh, so that was substituted out for the polyisocyanurate. So what you're seeing on the left is the foam glass insulation on the foundation. We've got four and a half inches so that it uh, comes flush, accounting for the, the sheathing on the wall above and the, the four inches uh, of, of um, mineral wool. Uh, and what's nice is that it allows us to continue the entire system down to the ground. Uh, so we have about one third of the foundation. It has this walkout condition um, at the back of the house here. And on the right, you can see the mineral wool. Um, one of the problems that we did have is that the compressive sp strength of the rigid mineral wool is not really comparable to the foil face polyiso that we would typically use in this detail. Um, we reviewed testing data that said that it worked and when we started to do our, our field mock-ups, um, it just wasn't working out. I think that there might be um, sub subcontractors who have to kind of finesse to make it work and not end up with, with, uh, with wavy siding, um, but uh, it just wasn't gonna happen. And so that was a change that we made in the field was to, to go with a, um, a rain screen attachment system, which was a thermal bridge that we had to um, account for. So this is not a passive house, but it could be. Um, just taking a quick look and playing around with our model a little bit, uh, substituting out the, the mineral wool uh, and using polyiso instead uh, is something that definitely helps. The, the big thing to stomach was definitely the, the slab insulation going from six inches to 14 inches um, is, a, is a tough one, um, but an alternative would have been to use 10 inches of type nine EPS. And the final thing that I needed to do to tweak the model was to improve the uh, U factor on the window frames. So we used a thermally broken aluminum uh, for the house, but if we had used PVC or thermally broken wood or, or anything with that, Similar, similar U value um, that would have brought us down to to the passive house levels. Our air barrier strategy uh, is located at the uh, at the outside of our sheathing, and it connects to our foundation and our sub slab uh, 10 mil poly. So this is sort of a a big advertisement for vapor shields. Um, self adhere air and weather barrier. Um, it was really nice product to, to use. We were able to bring it up and over our insulated parapets. Uh, and in general, it was, it was a great product that we installed over the, the plywood table. Um, that connects with our window systems with a, an exterior <coughs> window tape and uh, ties in with our, our sub slab uh, 10 mil poly to, to complete the system. A quick look at our mechanical systems. We use a modulating condensing boiler for both space heating and domestic hot water. Uh, the client had insisted on radiant, and so that was a, a good fit for, for this project. The um, uh, two-stage central AC system and a balanced whole house ventilation with energy recovery. Uh, 